what? Cosa Nostra was built to remain underground, operating in the shadows. No one was supposed to know they existed, even though you would have definitely felt their presence. First, there's no mafia. That all changed in October 1963 when one man revealed to the world all its secrets, arguably changing the course of American history, letting us in on how this secretive world really works. What the American Mafia managed to do is something quite revolutionary. They went from small fractured factions with no clear leadership or structure into what can only be described as a multi-billion dollar corporation with a rigid structure, a code of conduct, and pretty much all the other fun stuff we see in any Fortune 500 company. They had somehow managed to to organize crime and reap the fruits that came with it. But how did a small group of Sicilian immigrants within just a few years build a multi-billion dollar organization where their reach was felt in the highest echelons of power in the country? The story of Cosa Nostra begins all the way back in the mid-1800s, but where things really took off was in the Prohibition era. You see, this was considered the golden age for the mob. Money was pouring in like never before, but with all that cash out there, it was inevitable that people were going to start getting greedy, and that's when it all started falling apart. So there you have it, the opportunity of the century, and they go mess it up, just to satisfy their giant egos. But one man wanted to change all this. He realized how rare this opportunity was, and if they were gonna make the most of it, they needed to quickly fix this mess. And so, he had a vision to do something quite unheard of. He wanted to organize crime. Inspired by the robber barons of the time, why not evolve? Imagine what kind of money and power one could acquire if you could somehow monopolize crime. The one thing they lacked was order. Having to constantly fight and survive through power struggles is quite distracting, especially if your goal is to get as rich as possible. You might not live long enough to see your life's dream come to fruition, letting all that hard work go to waste. And all the old mustache peats did not want to change. So what do you do? You address the problem from its root. The biggest problem you face is that everyone was vying for the same position. No one wanted to be under the mercy of the other, especially given the history of the previous bosses. And given the amount of greed in the world, if you don't find a way, have all these egos in check, it will just continue to be this violent, never-ending cycle, and everyone will miss the whole point. There needs to be order to this chaos. And so, that's exactly what Charles Lucky Luciano strived to do. He said, we're gonna have... Uh the boss of all bosses. On April 15th, 1931, Lucky sets up a meeting with his Don Giuseppe Masseria at a small restaurant in Coney Island. They were gonna be plotting how to take care of Masseria's biggest rival, Salvatore Maranzano. When they played cards, Luciano excused himself to the bathroom. While in the bathroom, four men walked in towards Giuseppe, and, well, I think you know what happened next. <laughs> On September 10, 1931, a group of IRS agents entered the office of Salvatore Maranzano, who made sure his men were unarmed. But they went in to do a bit more than just audit his books. Of course, these were no IRS agents. Lucky had reached out to Meyer Lansky to organize four of his men to go and take out the last of the Mustache Peets. And he wasn't messing around. It didn't matter who he had to take out or even betray. If you stood in his way, there was only one way it was going to end for you. At the same time, he did something that allowed him to avoid falling for the same mistake his predecessors made. And this was when everything began to change. Shortly after the last boss of bosses was taken out, Luciano held a meeting in Chicago with some of the most powerful bosses in the country. During this meeting, Lucky would announce the creation of the Commission. It consisted of the five most powerful New York Dons, which were Vincent Mangiano, Tommy Gagliano, Joseph Bonanno, Joe Profaci, and Luciano himself. But the Commission was not going to rule just over New York. No, no, no. Why think so small? Luciano wanted to take over the country. And so alongside the five families sat Al Capone of the Chicago outfit, Stefano Magadino of the Buffalo crime family, and his longtime friend, Meyer Lansky. He was also happy to partner with highly capable individuals outside Cosa Nostra, stretching his influence nationwide. Now here's where you really see how much of an astute student of the game of power Luciano really was. Instead of falling for the same mistakes his predecessors made, satisfying his ego with a title like the boss of bosses, forcing the other dons to essentially bend the knee, he positioned himself to be elected into that position, while everyone was happy to do so. At the same time, it was clear who was the one in charge. There was a silent agreement between them that acknowledged Luciano as their unofficial leader. With this agreement cemented, they were to meet every five years to address any issues between the families. 
But what people don't realize is that a lot of what the commission was founded on and the overall modernizing of Cosa Nostra was not all Luciano's idea, but actually came from his predecessor, Salvatore Maranzano, who had taken many aspects from the Sicilian Mafia back home. I know, it gets quite a bit more complicated, but the point is this. Luciano knew how to bring in new ideas that could modernize the organization, all the while keeping the old traditions that were proven to have worked. Take a look at this. This is a chart that shows the structure of how a Fortune 500 company is structured. These companies are built in this way for maximum efficiency and, more importantly, maximum profitability. Now we look at this. See the similarities? Maranzano saw Cosa Nostra as the new Roman Empire and himself as its Caesar. But looking past these ideas of grandeur, Lucky saw how effective this structure actually was. The brilliance of this structure really showed in the case of Al Capone, who despite his Chicago crime empire waging war throughout the streets of the city in broad daylight, he himself could only eventually be sent to prison on charges of tax evasion. It was the key that allowed the Mafia to survive as long as it did, especially compared to other criminal organizations. Let's break it down. At the very top of this hierarchy is the boss, or the Don. The boss, as the name entails, is the head of the organization. He's the one who makes all the important decisions and is obeyed by everyone. Only the most powerful mafiosi have ever reached this far. Much like a CEO of a company, the boss oversees all the operation of the family, however delegates most of his mundane or day-to-day -day responsibilities to his inner circle, which includes his consigliere and his underboss. Each boss's management style might differ. Some like to be more hands-on, ensuring their underlings are kept at bay. I want to stay close to everything. Because being on the spot, I can see trouble immediately. Trouble is like a cancer. You gotta get it early. If you don't get it early, it gets too big, then it kills you. That's why you gotta cut it out. Fabish? But some others like to delegate or are less involved with the criminal operations themselves and rather focus on the bigger ventures, wanting to be seen as reputable businessmen. But either way, they are the ones who call the shots. Regardless of how involved they are in the day-to-day -day operations, the bosses command respect by both their subordinates and even outsiders who know that crossing a Don or saying the wrong thing, well, let's just say it won't end well. Ah! And so when a boss gives an order, it better become a reality. Being the Don gives you power, authority, and respect, and so it's an extremely desired position and the ambition of any mafiosi to one day reach this title. But being in such a desirable position means that there's always a massive target on your back, whether it's from rival families, the police, or even people within your very own family. Which is why Cosa Nostra was structured in a way that insulated the boss by having a lot of buffers. Right, yeah, buffer. The family had a lot of buffers. Quite genius, really. So here's how it worked. The Don can only deal with his underlings through either his consigliere or his underboss, therefore never having to directly ever commit a crime. It's safe to say that this structure worked, maybe even too well. Next we have the consigliere. The consigliere is the right-hand man of the boss. He handles and organizes his meetings, reports any important information provided by the lower ranks, and communicates with the other families. The consigliere often represents the boss in negotiations or any other meetings when possible. They're also primarily responsible to provide counsel and act as an advisor to the Don, being able to talk fairly openly and honestly without any repercussions. The consigliere does not engage directly in the criminal operations of the family and does not command a regime. However, they still are regarded as extremely powerful within the family and viewed as a highly respected position. However, the role of the consigliere and extent of power given can differ depending on the boss and his relationship with the consigliere. In the world of the Godfather, Don Vito Corleone heavily relied on his consigliere in all matters. Although Tom was not as equipped with the skills necessary for him to be on the level of a Sicilian consigliere, such as Genco Abadondo, he still was, however, an excellent example of what a consigliere should be like. He was the perfect peacetime consigliere, utilizing his extensive knowledge of the law and having studied in some of the most prestigious universities in the world, and combined with Sonny Corleone's knowledge of the street, the Godfather was able to have an edge over all the other Dons. But don't get it twisted. In real life, this position was quite revered. During the height of his reign, guess who Lucky Luciano had as consigliere? He's one of the most famous New York gangsters of all time. Some of you might be surprised to hear this, but it was actually Frank Costello a man who would go on to be one of the most powerful and influential gangsters in American history. Even during his time as consigliere, he had his own businesses and operations that generated him millions of dollars, so don't think the position was in any way as limiting as it might seem.
Then we have the underboss. The underboss is the second in command and holds immense power and authority within the family. Now, although he may have less access to the Don, they do hold arguably the more powerful position in the family compared to the consigliere. Depending on the family, the underboss is usually someone with blood relations to the boss. Although the level of power differs from family to family, the underboss is usually the successor or the one who takes over if, for whatever reason, the boss is out of action, whether permanently or temporarily. Vito had given this position to his eldest son, Santino, and as we saw when the Don was out of action, it was Sonny's responsibility to take over and control the family. In real life, this was a major point of conflict between Frank Costello and Vito Genovese, but that's a story for a different time. And now we're getting to the core of Cosa Nostra. These are the guys who do all the boss's dirty work, the ones who keep the pyramid stable. These are the capo regimes. Think of Peter Clemenza or Salvatore Tessio. These are the guys on the ground coordinating and enforcing the Don's will. You were around the old timers who dreamed of how the family should be organized, how they based upon the old Roman legions and call them regimes, the capos and the soldiers, and it worked. Yeah, it worked. What Tom says right here is actually quite true, similar to how the Romans organized their armies, where the soldiers were divided up into groups of 6,000 men and were called legions. The mafia took this and altered it to fit their own needs. You see, each capo, who was basically a captain, would lead and manage a crew, aka a regime, which was made up of around 10 to 20 soldiers. The capos managed and enforced all the day-to-day -day activities within their designated territories and reported directly to the underboss and sometimes to the consigliere. The capos are the primary link between the management, so to speak, and the employees. Don Vito Corleone only had two capos, and they were two of his most trusted friends, who together had built the empire. Unlike in some other families, both Clemenza and Tessio could directly access the Don due to their years of friendship and didn't have to constantly go through the underboss or consigliere. But in real life, most families had closer to four to six capos. And now we finally have the lowest ranking members within the family, the soldiers or made men. These were the individuals who really got their hands dirty and carried out the various crimes the family was involved in. They were the ones collecting money, carrying out hits and so on. Just to show you how efficiently organized these guys were, listen to this. To ensure all the families got along and no one would become too power-hungry, the commission had put a cap on the number of made men each family could have at one time. It's hard to know the exact number, but most sources seem to say that it could range anywhere from 10 all the way to 1,000 soldiers per family. But even though they were the lowest-ranked members of the family and the ones who faced the most day-to-day -day risks, being a made man did come with various different perks that outsiders couldn't access. Now, the lowest rank in this hierarchy are known as associates. An associate can be anyone who shows some valuable skill or capabilities that could be utilized by the family, yet doesn't meet the requirements to become an official made man. Think Jimmy Burke or Henry Hill. They could also be considered as interns given they meet the mafia's criteria. Although you wouldn't be part of the family directly and would have no say in what happens around you, this is generally the entry point for all. Now let's say that, hypothetically, you hear all this and think, you know what, this all sounds great, how do I get started? Since you now know the potential prospects this career path has in store for you, you're ready to begin your hypothetical new career. Of course, someone as ambitious as yourself isn't gonna settle. You don't wanna remain in the rat race, doing scores here and there. You wanna become a made man. You wanna be part of the family and climb its ranks. And who knows, maybe one day you'll become the Don. But wait, let's not get too ahead of ourselves. Before even thinking about joining your new family, there's quite a lot of work to do. First, you'll need to prove yourself as a valuable asset to the family. So, you carry out some worthy crimes in your neighborhood and get the attention of a made member who you then start making money for. After a while, you actually start making a decent amount of money. You're building your reputation and life's pretty good. But this isn't enough. A couple of years would go by and you've built a solid reputation of being a stand-up guy, a good fella. You also happen to come from an Italian family, another vital criteria. And now, the hard part. If you're not an asset, then you're a liability, and nobody likes those. So this is where you make your bones. Today you make your bones on Paulie. You understand everything? How's Paulie? Oh, Paulie won't see him no more. 
Now, if you check all these boxes, all you need to do is wait. Wait for the family to open the books. As we mentioned earlier, each family has a capped number of made men, so you'll need to wait for there to be an opening before the family can accept new members. Soon, you'll receive a call. You won't know when this takes place. All they'll tell you is to get dressed. Then you'll be picked up and driven to an undisclosed location. Inside, you'll walk in a room full of made men and other high-ranking members of the family. You'll then be asked if you know why you're here. You know exactly why. However, you reply no. And so your initiation begins. This is all based on the traditions of the Sicilian Mafia. Congratulations, you are now a made man. You are now officially part of the family. But like everything with the Mafia, nothing came without a price. If you're gonna enjoy the benefits the family provides you, well, you better not break any of its laws. The primary law you must abide by is the Code of Omerta, the code that holds this thing of ours together. It's a code of conduct, a code of honor. You and your new family must abide by it. Now you are born again into this new family. Your main purpose is to make the boss as much money as possible. We would need a whole video breaking down how these schemes worked. Throughout the years, the sources of revenue changed, but the palette they worked from has pretty much remained the same. The story of Cosa Nostra goes quite deep. We've literally only scratched the surface, so let us know if you want to know more. Now, as we know these organizations are not as great as they're projected to be, in the end it's not only about honor or loyalty, rather a constant power struggle, a treacherous life fueled by greed. There is, however, one mafia worth joining, one where you will only benefit and actually enhance your life for the better. Of course, this is without a doubt the Culture Mafia. But in all seriousness, thank you for all your support. Our goal with this channel is to help you and show you how to win in the game of power, sharing with you some of the most interesting stories out there, giving you all the keys and principles that will allow you to conquer your goals, all the while doing so in a truly honorable manner. Despite what some people think, it is possible to win the game without sacrificing your morals. Now, it's not easy, but it's absolutely worth it. So join us as we grow on this journey. We have some very big things coming, so stay tuned.